This message is brought to you by Starbucks. I made sure to have a whole lot of it this morning. Um, I mean, that's a little different than some mornings where I just have a medium amount of highly caffeinated brew. Uh, but yes, I'm ready to go today. Uh, last week, we uh, started our new series called Faith Over Fear, and we talked about three major elements to biblical faith. And, and if you remember, I'm just going to give you a quick review of what those are. The first is being able to acknowledge um, who you are, uh, because the truth is um, all of us do things that are wrong. And there are times when we slow down enough to, to look at ourselves, and we can acknowledge that if we, if we look at our lives with honest hearts. Um, and we also acknowledge then who God is, and he's, he's greater than we are, and his plans are different than, we, than, than ours are, and his plans for our lives are different than our plans are for our lives. And the, the, second step is then, um, the second step is then to surrender to God. So acknowledging who you are, acknowledging who God is, and then surrendering to God and saying, I want to go your way instead of insisting upon my own way. And, and the third part is true life change. It's kind of the, the proof is in the pudding kind of uh, part of, of faith because your life will always change if God, if you've surrendered your life to God. And that's why when you look at your life sometimes and sometimes other people's lives, you'll say, wait, wait a second, I, I know that you say that you believe in Jesus, I know that you've acknowledged that you're a sinner, that, that you haven't gone God's way, and you say that you're going his way, but, but for some reason it doesn't seem like your life is actually going that way. I hear what you say, but it doesn't really add up. And, and that's because maybe it doesn't add up because maybe those other steps weren't actually taken. So faith is really, there are three major parts of biblical faith. And, and here at Naperville Christian Church, we ultimately want you to have faith in God. And, and not just the God that you wish existed, but the God who actually does exist. The, the God who is revealed in scripture, in the Bible. Uh, my hope in this series is that you will, um, you will see in real and tangible ways how as you move toward choosing faith, as you move towards choosing faith, um, you can let go of very specific fears because fear is, is always the enemy uh, of having a stronger faith. And we have real and specific fears in our lives, don't we? I don't believe in just telling Bible stories in church. Growing up, the, the few times that I actually remember really connecting with what a pastor was saying, I remember, I remember several times thinking, I, you're, you're reading the Bible to me, but I don't understand how it applies to my life. And, and more and more here at NCC, I want us to make sure that we are making that connection so that the Bible is not just left in pages in, in a book. Because if we can't connect the stories of Scripture with our experiences today, we are going to just leave it on the shelf aren't we? We need to be able to connect the stories on the page with our actual lives. Otherwise, it's not real faith. They're just stories, and we're going to leave them right there on the shelf. Our theology must intersect with our real lives. Otherwise, it is just stories on a page. So today, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. We're going to go back to the beginning. We're going to go back to the start of creation, and we're going to look at part of the creation story. And uh, before we do that, I want to go back to childhood. I'm going to dial you guys back to childhood. So, so put on your, your kid caps today and, and think about what grade school was like. Okay, M Maybe don't do that too long because for some of us it wasn't the best experience ever. Uh, but, but I want you to kind of go back to childhood and I want you to remember a, a particular game that I'm sure that you played in at least one of your classes. Do you remember the game Telephone? Okay, you guys remember the game telephone. If you don't remember the game telephone or you never played the game telephone, it's just real simple. All the kids in the class would sit in a big circle or, or just in one big long line. And one person had to come up with a statement. They just had to, they had to decide what it was. They, they wanted to convey something to the rest of the group. So the, the kid might say something like, uh, and I, yes, I, I planned this part because it's, it's part of the story. The kid might say something like, um, uh, I gave my mom a, a Louis Vuitton bag last Christmas, and she liked it a lot. Now, I say that because my own mother would really like a Louis Vuitton bag. But I did not give it to her last Christmas. But I thought about my mom, and I thought she would really like a Louis Vuitton bag if I gave it to her last Christmas, but I didn't do that. So the first kid says that, passes it to the second kid. Now, here's, here's part of the, the rule of the game. They can only say it once. 
You can only convey the message once, and you can't ask any questions. You can't say, I'm sorry, I, 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 didn't, I didn't understand that. You have to relay exactly what you heard. So the first kid says, my mom really liked the Louis Vuitton bag I gave her last Christmas, and, and then relays that to the second kid. The second kid relays whatever he or she heard to the third kid all the way to the end of the line. And then it gets really funny for, for that last kid, because when you're in grade school, you don't like to be the one that's wrong. So that last kid's like, I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it. I remember one time I was the last kid and I was so embarrassed. I'm like, don't make me say it. Make this other person say it. You know, anybody but me. And, and then the last kid could easily say something like, my mom lives in a van down by the river. And anyone born after probably 1985 doesn't even know what I'm talking about. But some of you guys do. So you, it's really, really easy to mix up communication, isn't it? it w even, even in something that really doesn't mean anything, as, as children, the whole point of the game was to say, Are, did you put your ears on? I remember the teacher, my drama teacher, saying, so it sounds like some of you weren't listening very well. And, and then the drama teacher, it was Mrs. Tomley, who I still, I'm friends with on Facebook to this day, and I remember her saying, well, maybe some of you aren't speaking very clearly. Anybody have a teacher that always would say, you need to slow down a little bit, Billy. You need to, you need to speak more clearly. You need to enunciate. <laughs> Communication can have breakdowns for a whole lot of reasons. And, and that one is completely harmless, right? That's a completely harmless game. But it's a, it's a great way to show how quickly communication can get mixed up. But... Sometimes there's, there's something that's more diabolical going on. Sometimes it's not just about not listening well. We, we will see really quickly in this part of the creation story that we have a real adversary. And this adversary has a desire to actively break down the communication between God and us. He, he, his, his full interest is to break down our relationship with God. Now let's look at Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 through 13. Genesis 3, 1 through 13. It says, um, <clears throat> Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the, from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat it, when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. Sounds good, doesn't it? And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. It's like my worst dream. <laughs> So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me? She gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. <laughs> then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now the breakdown in the, the telephone communication game is funny, uh, but the breakdown between God and man, between God and Adam and Eve was anything but funny because we deal with, we deal with the side effects of the, the, the very first breakdown in communication. We, we inherited that and to this day, none of us can say that we don't have a breakdown in our relationship and our communication with God. And it all started in that first story. Now, here's the thing. They acted on a desire that was opposed to God. But it wasn't very straightforward, was it? 
It wasn't very straightforward. He, he didn't come, he, the, the serpent didn't go to them and say, I have a great plan and my plan is to destroy your relationship with your creator. I mean, all of us would probably be like, uh, that doesn't sound right. I, I'm, I'm going to decline that. Thanks for the offer. Um, I'll, I'll go with something else. And no, he comes at us in a different way. It's not, it's not as it's not as straightforward as that. Very rarely do we make a decision in our lives. Very rarely do we say, I know what I'm going to do today. As soon as I get out of bed and take a shower and drive to work, I'm going to make a decision at work that's going to destroy my life. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to destroy my life. I'm going to cheat on my wife. That's a, that sounds like a great idea. Let's go for it. Very rarely do we say that. Very rarely do we say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to choose to get addicted to substances because that sounds like a great way to end my life. We don't choose that. It's not as straightforward. It comes at us, at a, it comes at us like a serpent. It's slippery and it's, it's a little quieter and it's, it sneaks up on us and it promises us something different. We all fall for temptation because we believe that, that the, the promise of temptation is always greater than what it actually delivers. We, don't, we would never, ever choose to destroy our lives because we think that these things that we choose to do are going to deliver something greater than what we have now. It's not straightforward. But here's the thing. When we go, up, when we go for those things, when we become deceived... The promise is not fulfilled. It never is. The promise of temptation is never fulfilled. Think about this. Adam and Eve, they had the greatest start ever. They had the greatest start that, that has ever existed. They lived in paradise. They were given everything in the garden. They had a perfect connection with God. They were loved by their creator. They talked with him and literally walked with him in the garden every day. And they, loved, they had a perfect love between each other. That, I mean, that's, this, is a, this is a formula for a really terrific life. But they were vulnerable to deception, just as we are vulnerable to deception. Because by definition, deception is deceptive. It doesn't come straightforwardly, like I said, at you and say, hey, I've got a great idea. You're going to make this decision and you're going to destroy your life. Who's in? Nobody would say I'm in to that. So let's look at the lies that Eve believed. And what we're going to see is that we buy into the same lies today. The first lie that she believed came in the form of a simple question. And it's one we fall for every day. Did God really say that you can't eat from all the trees in the garden? Now you might not get that exact question, but, but you're always struggling with, is it okay for me to do this or not? Is it okay for me to, you know, how far, how far can I go in my flirting in my office before it's not okay? I mean, it's not, it's not a full-fledged affair. We know God's against affairs, but, but what about flirting? It's harmless. I mean, it's looking. It's not touching, right? It's, it must be okay. How far can I go? Did God really say that that is wrong. We ask those questions all the time. You know, it's, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Did God really say that. Now Eve answered correctly on the first try. She answered very, very specifically. She said, no, God said we could eat of um, any tree in the garden except the one in the middle. And God said that if we ate of the one in the middle, we would die. Eve one, serpent zero. She answered correctly. A lot of us get derailed at the first question, don't we? Did God really say it? We're like, I don't know. I don't ever read the Bible. I, you know, I don't know. Did God really say that? I, I guess my view of God is that he's always going to be gracious to me. So I think that I can do anything that I want. Yeah, that sounds biblical. I'm free to do whatever I want according to my gospel. And God must agree with me because I think my thoughts are a whole lot like his. Yep, I feel better. I'm going to go on the path that I want to go on because I think God agrees with me. He thinks I'm a pretty good guy. We often fall with the very first question. Why? Because we don't know what God really said. We really don't know 
Most of, our, most of us are so confused about what God really said and, and we have all these conversations about the Bible and we have conversations with other people about the Bible without actually having read the Bible. It's amazing how many opinions people have about the Bible who have never actually read the Bible. We talk about books that talk about the Bible. We talk about prayer that, that, that we hear about in the Bible, but we don't pray and we don't read Scripture. So how on earth, why on earth are we shocked when we, are, we fall into deception about what God said when we don't know what God said? Here's the thing. Temptation will always win if we don't have a basic grasp a basic understanding of what God actually said. And guys, if, you're, if you come here and you're thinking that on Sunday morning you're going to get a basic grasp of what God said in the Bible, you will never, you will never have a one mark next to your name versus the devil. He will always, always win. Round number one, if you don't have a basic grasp of what the Bible says. Here's the second thing. Eve wasn't out of the woods yet because if Satan can't get you on the first try, he always has another plan. Always has another plan because he came at her with another angle. If he couldn't get her to be confused about what God said, then he tried to get her to doubt God's goodness. If he couldn't confuse her about what God said, he was going to confuse her about God's goodness. And he did that by telling her that actually... She wouldn't die. She would just become enlightened. That sounds, that sounds different, doesn't it? Wait a second. Maybe, maybe God isn't looking out for my needs after all. I mean, I mean all of us have prayers that have gone unanswered over years, so that must mean that, that I need to go in my own direction. And, and boy, if I do that one thing that I really want to do, all of my dreams are going to come true and, and my eyes will be open and I will, I will be enlightened and I will reach that level and I will do yoga. And ah, uh, yes, I'm enlightened. I'm feeling it now. We believe it. And I'm not, I'm not tearing down yoga. I do yoga occasionally too, but not the spiritual yoga. It's the lie that all of us face about God. Is he for me or against me? Is doing what I want with my life really wrong or is he just trying to keep me from having fun? How many of you have thought that? I know a lot of kids, when they've grown up in church and then they go to college, they're like, God was just trying to keep me from parties and parties are fun. So therefore, God must have, he, he must not want me to have fun. That's, I remember thinking that. Are affairs really wrong or is it just a nifty way to spice up my life? Is looking at pornography wrong or is it just a way to uh, re, reinvigorate an, an old marriage? We, we wonder these things, don't we? We wonder if God is holding out on us. And basically, we're, what we're saying is, does God have my best interest at heart or not? It's the second way he comes at us. Should I just go and make my own way in this life since things aren't really going the way I'd like them to anyway? How many of you have hit struggles in your life? Maybe it's right now. You're struggling and you know that you can continue going in the way that God says, but you're just not seeing the results of it yet. You're walking down the path. You're reading scripture with the most sincere heart that you can have. You're praying. You're getting together with other believers, but life is not turning out the way you thought it would. And right now, you are vulnerable to that voice that says, is God really for me? And really what you're saying is, if he's not for me, then I'm going my own way and I'm throwing out the whole mess. Has anybody felt like that before? Be brave. You can raise your hand. It's okay. It's, it, there's a place to be truthful. I've felt that way before. Surely some of others have. I've wrestled with that because really, some, when, it, when it comes down to it, sometimes my, the question we really are asking is, what's in it for me? What's in it for me here? Because I keep trying to do the right thing, but I'm getting all these horrible results. Maybe I'm doing it wrong. If he can get us to doubt God's goodness. So Eve ate it. She ate the fruit and, and, and Adam was, was right there next to her. And because Eve was such a selfless person, 
she gave some fruit to Adam. And Adam, like every husband, never questions what his wife gives him to eat. Because we know better than that. My first year of marriage, when Brandy would make something that she'd never made before, and she'd say, how does that taste? The answer was always awesome. Because I wanted to stay married. Sometimes, and alive. And sometimes, she'd look at me and say, I know that's not true, let's order pizza. And I'd be like, yeah, that's true, it's pretty, it's pretty bad. She'd be like, really? So Eve ate it, and she looked at Adam and said, here, and he goes, oh, food. He didn't have a thought about it at all. He didn't say anything. Scripture doesn't say that he said anything. No questions asked. And then something strange happened. Because it says as soon as they both ate a bite of the fruit, their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. Now, we don't know how closed they were before, but their eyes were opened to something new. The promise of the adversary was enlightenment. And in some ways, it came true because it, they were opened. But it wasn't a good opened. It wasn't a good open. It was an ugly open. And how do we know that? Because as soon as they did it, their eyes were opened to the point that, oh my gosh, we're naked. They had no concept of being naked before. It was just living in perfect harmony with each other and with God. They had no concept of that. And all of a sudden, they felt ugly. They thought, oh my gosh, we got to cover up, we got to cover up the parts. We're not supposed to be like this. They weren't told that. But, but eating that fruit, they went against what God said and their eyes were open to that. So they, they got fig leaves and they covered up the parts, and the, but that wasn't enough. They were embarrassed. They were ashamed. That's always what happens. When you bite that fruit of temptation, whatever it is in your life, you're ashamed. And how do you know deep down, no matter what your beliefs are, you, you know that something is wrong when you don't do it out in the open. You know something's wrong when you have to do it behind a closed door. And all of a sudden, they knew that they needed to hide. They did not want to see God that day. Maybe he'll forget that he always takes a walk in the garden at three. Maybe he, he won't notice that we're not around. But we think things like this. We hide. We hide from our friends. We don't answer the phone. We don't respond to text messages. We know that we've done something wrong. We feel ashamed, so we hide. But God always comes looking. He always comes knocking. And as he's walking through the garden, they heard those steps that had always been welcome steps before. To this point, they had always been welcome steps. They wanted to meet up with God in the garden and have a walk with their creator. But this time, they didn't like it. And God says, so where, where are you? Adam, Eve, what's going on? We always walk together. And they said, well, we noticed that we're naked. So we, we, we decided to hide. And God knew what they'd done, but he wanted them to say it. He knows what you've done. He wants you to say it. So he said, did you eat of the fruit that I told you not to eat of? In other words, that one tree, the one limitation I put on you, did you eat from that? And what does Adam say? It's her fault. <laughs> God, you created her second for a reason. <laughs> it's her fault. She did it. It's not me. It's her. She did it. So he looks at Eve. Well, what did you do? <laughs> that snake did it. That snake that you created, you made him. He tricked me. He deceived me and I did it. And that's what we still do today, don't we? When we do something wrong, we don't, most of the time people don't say, I did it. Most of the time people say, well, actually, and they give you this big, long story about what really happened. And there are way too many details. And you're like, wait a second. People that have that many details usually aren't telling the truth. Because that's way too many details. So Adam and Eve responded like we respond. Every person I've counseled does that, has done that. Every person that I've counseled, when they are questioned about their behavior, they do it. Adam blamed God. Adam blamed God for giving that woman. 
and, and, and Eve blamed, and not even Eve, he didn't even say Eve, he goes, that woman. It's sort of like when our kids do something and you say, your child did that. <laughs> we don't want to take any ownership, even with the way we phrase things. We just blame. And the truth is, we have an adversary. We have an adversary. There is a strong spiritual power, and he's going to do everything in his power to deceive us. But we aren't helpless either. We're not helpless and we're not hopeless because God has given us all that we need to say no to the deception. And we can't use the excuse, the devil made me do it, which is what Eve did. And we can't say, my wife made me do it, which is what Adam did, or any other lame excuse because one day we'll stand before God and he's going to say, nope, you did it. You did it. You're the one that's responsible for the mess of your life because of your decisions. I want to leave you today with a few simple ways that you can choose faith over fear as you move into 2014. The first is very, very simple, but it's going to take some willpower. The first is to get to know what God has to say. And we have so many simple ways to do this, guys. We, we literally have, it, it, we have so many ways to get to know what God has to say. You can do it the old-fashioned way and open up, open up a Bible and just start reading. Okay, a lot of you guys won't do that. So let me give you easier ways than that. Okay, easier ways. Go to Bible.com. You can remember that. Bible.com and sign up to read the Bible in a year. And every day, whatever email address you put in there, it will send you the verses for that day. So you will read the Bible in, in 365 days. So next January, theoretically speaking, each one of you could read the entire Bible in a year. And if you are serious about avoiding temptation or learning to say no to temptation, you need to start, start understanding what God actually said. Bible.com, commit to reading the Bible in a year. And you can start to combat the lies that you're going to be tempted to believe in. You can choose faith over fear by knowing what God has to say. Here's what you have to know. When Jesus was tempted in the desert by the devil— he did not enter into conversation with him. Okay, this is very important to take note. He did not enter into a conversation with him. I think a lot of us have a lot of conversations with the devil. Maybe not face to face, but we, we try to say, well, I don't know, did God really say that? And we, we get mixed up. Jesus he just quoted, he quoted Old Testament passages about who God is and what God said straight back to the devil. He did not enter into conversation with his own words and he was successful and we'd be wise to do the same. So here's the second way to battle temptation. So the first one, get to know what God says. Go to Bible.com, sign up. And if you, here's what I'd like you to do. If you are signing up for that, you can go to Bible.com and sign up and you can get it sent to your email address or you can get an app for your smartphone. Um, if you are doing that, would you, would you send me an email? Would you send me an email after you do it? It'd be awesome to, to be able to find out. I'd love to hear that this message inspired you to say yes to something. I don't want, I, it's, it's never a compliment if someone just says, well, that was a really good message. Because my, my second, my, the second thing I'll say, the first thing I'll say to the person is, well, did it inspire you to do anything to get closer to God? And if the answer is, well, no, but I was entertained, I'm, I'm, that does not please me. That's not why I do this. I don't do this to make people laugh. I do this because I'm trying to move people on their faith journey so they can say yes to God more often. So here's the second way to battle temptation. Remember that the promise your temptation is making will never be fulfilled. Anytime, once you start to get to know what God has to say about things, then you can recognize when temptation is headed your way and, and you can know you can know that if you're married today and the pretty little secretary comes up and, and, and she's interested in a sugar daddy and you're tempted, you look at the pretty little secretary and you're thinking, well, you know, she does look really good. Okay, because people have pretty little secretaries sometimes. Sometimes they do look really good. You can know that the promise that that, te that temptation is making to you, that your life will be better if you go for the pretty little secretary. You can know right away that it will be unfulfilled. 
I can't tell you how many men I've talked to that have come into my office and they've said, they've said, I am, I'm leaving my wife. I know I've got, you know, I've got a zillion kids and we've been married for 25 years and I'm just bored and we just, there's no flame anymore. So I am going, I'm going for it. I've already picked her out and I am doing it. I've literally had men tell me that that's what they're going to do. I've had men look at me and say, this is the better way for all of us. We fight too much. I'm just going to go. And every single time I say to those guys, it's not going to be what you think. You're going to destroy your wife. You're gonna dis- your, your kids are going to hate your guts. They're going to hate you for this. And they're going to do the same thing in, in their lives it, because that happens. When, when that happens in one generation, a lot of times it happens in the next and the next and the next. They're going to hate your guts for it. They're going to they're think of you as a miserable parent. You're going to walk away and then you're going to screw up someone else's life and it's not going to be the promise. It, it won't be fulfilled. And, and there, you're even more likely to leave that next person or that person's going to leave you. It's going to be ugly. I know you think it's going to be this beautiful thing, but it's a false promise. And I've had some of those men come back to me years later and say, I still went through with it. I did what I thought I should do. And I wish I could go back to my original garden. It wasn't perfect. It was very imperfect. But we could have worked on it. It could have been better. But I went with my own thoughts and my own feelings and my own emotions. And it, the promise was unfulfilled. I wish I, I wish I hadn't done it. All temptation is a lie. John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus said, the devil is the father of lies. He's always going to throw sneaky lies at you to try to get you to bite. Remember, your pro- the promise, the temptation is making will never be fulfilled. Here's a final way to battle temptation. Remember that every struggle you face is from dark spiritual forces. Every struggle you face. You look at a person and you're like, no, it's that person. No, it's that person, it's that person, it's that person. No, no, no. Every struggle you face is from dark spiritual forces. The Apostle Paul said it like this, Ephesians 6.12. He said, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. In other words, our struggle is not against people, even though it comes at us in the form of people. What's driving those people is, is what's causing it, not those people. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That sounds like there's really something significant going on that we don't see. Well, we better start paying attention to it. Because the sooner we realize that we're in a real battle, the sooner we can lift up our shield and and deflect it. You don't ever see people walking around with a shield, do you, unless they're in battle. But a lot of us, don't, we don't ever put up our spiritual shields and say, I have to be alert to this because the devil is trying to throw me off my game. He's trying to confuse me in my relationship and my connection with God and my relationships and my connections with people. He's trying to get me off my game. The sooner you realize you're in a battle and there are real spiritual forces at work against you, the sooner you can raise that shield the sooner you're going to learn the word, know what God has to say, and you can say no to the false promises that temptation is making to you. But here's what you have to know. You're going to lose some battles. You're going to lose some battles. And for some of us, some some perfectionists out here, I can look and see some of you who are kind of perfectionists. You think, well, I screwed up once. That means I'm screwed up because I don't accept failure. Well, Christianity is a religion of failure. Christianity is a religion for failures. Because we recognize, one day we say, we can't do this. No matter how much I try to be good, I fall, I screw up, I fail. We don't put our hope in ourselves and in our abilities to say no. We put our hope in the cross because at the cross, he made it all right. It's not about us. It's about him. And when we say yes to him, he picks us up and he dusts us off and he says, keep walking. The only way you lose this is if you choose to stop 
walking. Get up, thank him for forgiveness. If you need to be reminded about who he is, read some scripture, reprogram your mind, and learn to say no to the temptations that come your way because they will never be fulfilled. No matter how sweet it seems, no matter how good that fruit looks, it won't give you what it promises. It will leave you empty and destroyed and rotted inside. And every week here at NCC, we take communion. And we take communion to remember what Jesus did for us, that this perfect God came to earth in the form of a man and he showed us how to live in a new way. Not so we could be more perfect. He did it to to say, I'm giving you my perfection. I'm giving it all to you. I'm giving it all to you. You you have become my righteousness. When we say yes to him, we don't have to struggle and strive. We can be motivated by love, the love that was given to us first by our creator. And if every Sunday before you receive communion, you have to say, God, but I screwed up again, he'll say, I know. And I still love you. And I always will. Receive that today. If you have failed this week, all of us have about something. I am pretty confident to say that there is nobody here that has not sinned this week. If you've sinned this week, just acknowledge it in your own heart to God. Say, God, I thank you for a new chance today. I thank you that your mercies are made new Every morning, not just one time a month, it's every single morning. I give my garbage to you and I receive the goodness that you have to offer. Help me to live differently. Empower me, heal me, touch me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you have, you've given us a way out Temptations come our way all the time and, and so often we, we believe it. In, in a moment, we put our shield down and we forget who you are. We forget that you love us, that you're for us. We put our shield down and we say, okay, I, <clears throat> I guess that's the way to go and we go the wrong way and we realize because of the shame we feel that it was wrong and it's not good and we're tempted to stay down and just sort of stay in the, the muck and be miserable and listen to sad songs, but you don't want us to stay there. But through the cross, we can always stand again. Through the cross, we can be made new. We can have a fresh start. Lord, we receive that today. As we take the bread and the juice, we thank you that we are not powered by our own will, our own actions. We are powered by you. And we praise you for it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Before we go out today, will you stand with us? And um, as Neil preaches this series on faith over fear, this is going to be kind of our, our theme song for this series is Give Me Faith. So let's sing this all together. Don't forget to go to Bible.com and get on track to read your Bible in a year. We'll see you next week.